Okay, there it goes. To introduce our speaker, and Melissa Wackerly is the lead administrator on four projects and serves as project team manager on 20 plus additional lead projects. She has taught numerous USGBC chapter workshops and training classes. Melissa served as a project team manager on Alliance Town Center, which was a um, pilot lead ND project in Texas, and currently serves on the lead ND committee for the local U.S. and sustainability master's degree in sustainability and development from Southern Methodist University here in Texas. So with that, Melissa, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Abra. Hi, everybody. Um, I wanted to give you my apologies for the second prisoner, Lee Hall, who developed this, this program with me. And he wasn't able to make it today, so I'm going to be giving his portion of the presentation. Uh, he's with Sustainable Church. specialize in lead for neighborhood development and lead homes. So uh, bear with me for this first portion of the program because it was developed by Lee and I know it, but uh, he gives it much more smoothly than me. So um, let's just jump into it. I'm from the VET group. I uh, work in architecture and uh, Lee also, as I mentioned, developed this as well. And uh, we developed it in conjunction with our local USGBC North Texas chapter. Um, we are an education provider for USGBC. This has AIA continuing education as well as APA. Our learning objectives are to understand the basics of lead for ND rating system, uh, recognize the driving the drivers of lead ND, and understand how lead ND measures those dri those driving issues. Um, so. This is a quick overview for USGBC and the uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Rating System. Uh, it's developed by the U.S. Green Building Council and implemented by the Green Building Certification Institute. Um, the background of LEAD for ND, it started really developing in 1994 and developed through the pilot system, um, of which both Lee and I have projects in North Texas. These projects did not get certified, he decided not to go for the final certification. The Alliance Town Center project that Abra mentioned did get certified under the pilot for what's called stage two, and we'll talk about the stages in a minute, but that one will not be uh, going after the, the stage three final certification. That one. So LEAD and D is a little bit different than the typical USGBC LEAD system because it was developed beyond just USGBC. Uh, the USGBC actually partnered with the uh, Congress for New Urbanism and the National Resources Defense Council. So this is a partnership of something just beyond the building method and the, the exposure that one building can, can have to a community, um, the impact that it can have to a community. So it really reached out to these other two organizations to get input because they understood that that both the National Resources Defense Council and the CNU had specific ideas on how neighborhoods could be developed more sustainably. Can yeah. you hear me? Can, can you speak up at all? I can't. Is that better? <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Do you need me to repeat anything that I just said? Um, it, they just say that uh, your voice goes in and out sometimes, so just try and keep the volume up. Definitely will. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so the impact that CNU and the National Resources Defense Council had on the system is basically looking at smart growth, new urbanism, and green building. And these things is, is improved to live, it's a quality of life. So the benefits of that are happier and healthier communities, better environment, and a, and a robust economy. We just talked a little bit about the benefits of LEED. Um, so typically what the LEED rating system measures is five categories plus innovation and design, and those are sustainable sites, energy and atmosphere, 
water efficiency, materials and resources, and indoor environmental quality. And so that's basically what for neighborhood development, that is completely different uh, categories. So you're looking at smart location and linkage, neighborhood pattern and design, and green infrastructure and buildings. They also do have the innovation and design credits as well. Now, the, rate, the difference of the rating system is because it's really looking at how the land is used, what land is being used, um, the fabric of the neighborhood, so that it just doesn't look at just the materials of the building, just the makeup of the building. It looks at the entire picture. So the ratings that are developed for Leeds and Neighborhood Development, as far as the points, are the same point categories that are available for the typical lead for new construction or commercial interiors uh, or any of the other rating systems. So 40 points to 49 points for certified, 50 to 59 for silver, 60 to 79 for gold, and 80 to 110 for platinum. The difference here is that there's 12 prerequisites for the lead and B system. And the credit distribution is as such. So you can see that neighborhood, neighborhood pattern and design is actually 40% of the credits that are available. So that's really weighted towards that, that CNU piece of the puzzle, the way the, the, the development is organized. Green infrastructure and buildings is 26%, and then smart location and linkage is 25%. So those are pretty close to equal, uh, with uh, innovation and design being 5%. Regional priority is going to be anything that, that was identified specifically uh, notable for a specific area. So for example, in North Texas, we have water issues. Um, we haven't had rain in about three months now. So uh, stormwater management may be something that we look at here or uh, water efficiency. So the three stages for submission are uh, different than any other system as well. Most lead systems look at design or construction, but the stages for submission for lead and D are a bit different. So one of the, the first stage is really just going to be a letter that the, that the developer receives in an effort to get their entitlements from the city. So this is before they have any entitlements from the city. You can go and just put a, kind of a conceptual plan together and submit it, and the, the USGBC and GBCI will uh, certify that as a stage one. Stage two is going to be more like a design phase submittal where the, the plan is more developed and the, the, the construction could actually have already begun. You can only, you can only submit for this up to 75% constructed. Once it's more than 75% constructed, you have to skip and go to stage three. So um, this is really just a design phase and making sure that every the plan that you have in place will, uh, will be able to be certified lead and deed. Stage three would be your final plaque. And so construction is beyond 75% or 100% complete, and uh, your, your final certification is awarded. So like I said previously, my project that I worked on was a stage two. So we have a certificate that shows that we have an approved plan, but we do not have an, a final plaque. So I'm going to go through some of the voluntary credits here in a little bit. Um, but the prerequisites in the lead and D system are very different from what you have in your typical lead rating systems. And so it really looks at where are you locating your site. Um, and so we're looking at hold on, I'm going to skip forward. We're looking at um, that it's an infill site or an adjacency site. So it's not a green field that's in an undeveloped area or surrounded by farmland. Um, so you have to make sure if you are in an outer lying area that you have to do some testing of soils and look at endangered species to make sure that you're not building on uh, an area that's prime habitat or prime farmland. And so with these, it also looks at where you build for your wetlands. So if you're building close to a wetland, you have to be able to mitigate how far you're building from that wetland. And you cannot impact that wetland um, except for very minor, minor ways. 
or a nature trail or something of that sort. So when you're looking at coastal development, that really comes into play, or also any kind of development near a lake or a stream. Um, and that's actually one of the one of the problems that we came in that we encountered whenever he developed he was looking at his lead for neighborhood development um, project Montgomery Farm, which is in Allen, Texas. He actually wasn't building very close to a, a creek, but it was and he was mitigating it in other ways, but it just wasn't something that was meeting the prerequisites. So other prerequisites would be uh, the green certified building, um, you have to have at least one certified building with another lead rating system. You have to have uh, minimum building and water efficiency, which is very much like the uh, the other rating systems. And then you have to have a split plan or a construction, uh, construction pollution prevention plan, which is going to be erosion control and sedimentation control and things like that that you would see in a typical system, lead rating system. But there's also some other interesting prerequisites. The, by far the most onerous credits or prerequisites that we have in the North Texas area would be um, for density. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of land here, and so a lot of developers really want to sprawl out. And so with density, we have to have at least a 0.5 uh, floor area ratio or a seven dwelling units per acre, which can be relatively difficult in uh, urban sprawl area, but it's very important for sustainable development because the more we sprawl, obviously, the more detail on the drivers behind that here in a little bit. So we talked a little bit about uh, the basic compact development requirement for the prerequisite. What's interesting is there's a higher compact development prerequisite for transit corridors. So if you're building in a transit location next to a rail station or something of that sort, you have to have 12 units per acre within a certain loss distance of the site. And you have to have uh, anything further than, I think it's a half a mile, uh, you have to have seven units per acre. And then for the non-residential areas, you have to have a 0.8 FAR as opposed to a 0.5. And then you have to, that's again beyond that, that half a mile loss distance to the rail station. There are some grants available uh, for HUD that, that can help finance some of this. There was a $25,000 grant given to a project here in Dallas just last year for the VA hospital, a lead and deep project developing next to that. You can get rating guides. Uh, Pricing depends on if you're buying hard copy, if you're buying a, a digital, if you're a USGBC member or not. You can, but you can download just the rating system, which is the basic credit requirements for free at usgbc.org. So it's really the the lead and lease system is designed to for looking at financial incentives, structural incentives for projects. Um, to look at how you want to evaluate how you are planning your development beyond the, the typical city zoning. So you really want to be familiar with that race rating system. What it's not supposed to do is replace typical plans and zoning that you see based from your city. Uh, you, it's not supposed to replace any environmental regulations, you know, the EPA or your local, um, here we have the Texas Council of uh, Environmental Quality, so any kind of local, state, agency that's going to preside over those environmental regulations is going to override, obviously. And then um, you can't certify an existing neighborhood that's, that's already been developed, and you can't try to certify a town or a city as a lead for MD development. So what are the issues behind lead for neighborhood development? This is kind of the face of climate change, cute little or cute big polar bear. This is what everybody sees and um, you know the polar bears are endangered, but what that, that's so far away and it's so distant and it's so um, difficult to get your head around. But basically there's lots of things regionally that you can do in your area that are that that drive not just global climate change, it doesn't that doesn't doesn't just drive uh, you know what's going on globally, but it looks at how we're using land locally and how it can solve local issues. 
So lead buildings are great, but lead developments are better. So here we have some lead platinum projects. And uh, the image on the left is uh, a utility office in, I think, Michigan. And basically, this is a lead platinum building. There's wind turbines. There's uh, automatic lighting controls. There's lots of great benefits of this building. But the problem of it is that it's not located nearby anything else. So any employees that have to commute there are going to have to go far from home or, you know, or um, you know, carpool or find other ways to get there. And there's also no fabric around it for, you know, what if you want to go have lunch to, at, at a restaurant or if you have a dry cleaner that's nearby or, um, you know, any kind of a there, there are, is some open space, but it's not really very well uh, managed. So this is a great building. It has a lot of great benefits, but there's, it does lack a few items. And then here on it might, it's a great home, again, great energy efficiency and wonderful green attributes, but it's a very large single occupancy home on a big site in a suburban neighborhood. Um, so there's, there's some things that could be improved about that as well. So what are the drivers behind the sustainable development movement? This is where I focus. This is um, really more of a regional issue. So what I've done here is focus on our specific issues here in the North Texas region. So what you see in this image is the North Central Texas Council of Governments projections for demogra demographic growth, for population growth. And you can see that the inner, the inner ring suburb and the inner city, you have some growth going on deep in downtown Dallas. Uh, Fort Worth is over here. And then we have, this is the mid-cities. Uh, the DFW airport is in this area. But here you see the, the bulk of the growth is really projected out and around the, the exurb. So this isn't necessarily going to be the, the best movement for, for the DFW Metroplex. So we're actually in DFW looking to increase our population by 5 million people by 2030. So that's about doubling our population by I'm sorry, growing our population by 50%. So one of the consequences of that is urban sprawl. And what you have here on the left is a picture of this area on the right taken in 1940. So it was basically a four-lane divided highway, uh, US Highway 75, and farmland all around. And so now what you see here is North Park Center, which is a large shopping center here. Um, this is a church and a cemetery, and this is all housing and uh, actually very dense housing. We have a rail line going up here, but you can see this actually used to be considered way out in the middle of nowhere uh, in, in Dallas whenever it was first developing, and now it's part of the, the core of the city. So the result of this is loss of habitat. And Oftentimes what we hear on the news here is uh, whenever you have you hear about bobcats in people's neighborhoods and killing their smaller dogs and cats. And so there's a reason why these kinds of things are happening because these, these, these critters no longer have a place to go. They don't have a place to live. And so they, they impact our, our, live, our lives, but we're impacting theirs more severely. We also have the loss prime farmland. So what happens with this is where we build our cities or where we have historically built our cities are around agricultural centers, so where farmers would come and trade their goods at market. Well, what happens whenever you build your cities up around those areas, the, the farmers would put the, the trade centers closest to the, to the prime farmland. And so now all this prime farmland has been developed. So we're losing prime farmland in the United States at an alarming rate. Along with habitat loss is going to be stormwater issues. So where you had vegetation and uh, trees and prairie lands or even farmland, you're getting amazing amounts of erosion. 
and so you're losing that topsoil as well that's going to be uh, beneficial to agriculture. So this is a this is an image that I think is interesting because this is from a a uh, asphalt company in Colorado, and they were very very proud of this work. And basically, what's happening is there's no infiltration of water; it's all running downstream. And when water runs downstream, you have issues. And so, <laughs> this is what can often happen when water runs downstream at a without infiltration at a at a too fast pace. So these are flash floods that we have here in North Texas quite often, and also in the Central Texas region. This is actually close to the Brazos River in Central Texas. And here we have very clayey soil, so there's not a whole lot of infiltration anyway. And whenever you're, you remove impervious, or when you, when you remove pervious surfaces, and especially grasses and things like that that hold the water and infiltrate it down, um, then uh, you basically get flash floods. There's been a lot of instances here where people's homes have eroded into adjacent creeks. There's been some instances where people have been washed away in creeks. There was one incident where uh, two young women were crossing a bridge in their car, and the car was swept into a large creek here in Dallas, and one of the girls passed away. So there's definitely impacts to development as in addition to the, the undeveloped areas that are, that are that we're losing. So when we go out like this, it's not just that we build a building in the middle of nowhere. It's that we have to build infrastructure to get there. So it takes energy. It takes time. It takes uh, effort. It takes materials to build these this infrastructure. So here we have road construction. We also have to design for water and wastewater, obviously. And so where we have sprawling development, we have to bring utilities out to those as well. And again, that takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of materials, um, which can be good because that's jobs. Uh, on the other hand, there's infrastructure needs in previously developed areas already so where we have failing infrastructure. And so there's a lot of job, uh, job opportunities there as well. What's interesting about the way that sprawl happens is that the cities in, 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 a, in a way, in an effort to bring development to their community, will pay for all this infrastructure. So this is something that the developers basically get for free. And uh, the cities and uh, taxpayers have to um, bear the brunt of the cost, while the developers typically get uh, the bulk of the benefits. So, what happens whenever we build out in sprawl, or what happens when we build out in this sprawl format, is that we have um, massive automobile-centric development. And so what you see here, this is actually an image of San Antonio, Texas. But it really doesn't have we be any city in the country. It could be Kansas City, it could be Dallas, it could be Sacramento, it could be any of those places because it's all basically centered around the car. And so what's interesting about this is you see, where do you see the person in this? Where do you see the, the human being walking down the street? There, there's no comfortable place to walk down the street in this. And I, I remember going to a movie theater, it's a, it's a redeveloped movie, uh, Trip Center here was made into a movie theater. There's a couple of stores that are down the way. And basically, it looks something like this. <laughs> and I remember we were waiting for our movie to begin. And we were trying to see what the stores were to, see, to go in. We would walk past the store. There would be no sign in the, on the door. There would be no sign in the window of what that store was. You'd kind of go look in and see what sort of merchandise they had. But in order to actually know what the store was, we had to walk out into the parking lot. So there was no pedestrian signage whatsoever, even for people who are waiting to see a movie. And I'm sure that happens fairly commonly there. So along with sprawl development and um, auto-centric development, 
Central Texas Council of Governments uh, map that is the cost and impact areas of congestion. In 2007, when this analysis was done, the, the annual cost of congestion was $4.2 billion, and that's in lost time, um, infrastructure needs, uh, wear and tear on vehicles and things like that. And then you have the projected 2030 cost, uh, annual cost of congestion at $6.5 billion. And you can see here where the congestion is increasing in these exurban areas and then also out in these outlying areas. And so this is all based on spur development, on, on uh, sprawl development. And so what's happening here is the estimate on this is that There's rail basically predicted everywhere here. So this is with increased um, public transportation, but it's still causing real problems with uh, projected traffic congestion. With traffic congestion comes air quality issues. Dallas Fort Worth has actually been a non-attainment area for EPA air quality standards for many years now. Um, we've developed several plans and have implemented several plans to improve our air quality, and they have improved. However, the, as, as our air quality becomes in attainment, the EPA increases the, the standards again because there's always going to be a, a more ramped up version of the best that can be, or the, the, I guess the least toxic they're, they're willing to accept. And again, with that, whenever you talk about the infrastructure, infrastructure impacts air quality as well. Because if you're, because if you're building a concrete road, you have to fire that, that cement. And so the cement is fired typically in the same region, which is good for the local economy and, and good for uh, not transporting materials for a long way, but at the same time, you have this cement that's being fired and more uh, nitrous oxide and um, sodium oxide and uh, carbon dioxide being emitted into the atmosphere at the same time. Something else that, that impacts development is uh, centralized power. So if you, have, if you have your power centralized in distant areas um, or and one location that's a large, let's say, coal-fired or gasoline or um, compressed natural gas power company, then there's an 8%, a minimum 8% loss of energy generation within just the transmission of that. And so if we could find a way to decentralize our power where, it's, where the demand is met, we can also reap benefits for, from uh, using waste heat and waste energy at the same time. Another issue with, decentral with centralized power is that uh, you have a target, and that's basically for any kind of attack, let's say a terrorist attack or something like that, that if you, if you damage that centralized power location, it will make a big impact on the grid. Another driving factor of the least neighborhood development system is obesity rates. So you can see here, these are obesity rates. Um, basically, the, the percentage of population that has a body mass index index equal to or above 30. So that's about 30 pounds overweight for a typical 5 foot 4 person. Um, in 1990, there were, there were no states with an obesity rate over 10 to 14 percent with the with the, with the BMI over equal to or above 30. In 1999, you can see that many of these, many of these uh, Southern states and middle west, uh, Midwestern states are increasing in obesity with uh, 20 to 24 percent obesity rates at uh, BMI above 30. In 2009, you can see the lone holdout of uh, Colorado, and that's right, that's risen to 15 to 19 percent. And you have many of these southern states with a uh, body mass index above 30. Th these affect things like uh, insurance rates that affect uh, longevity, it affects quality of life. So um, this is often, uh, in some in some ways, att attributed to this automobile society that we have. If we sit in our car, um, sit in our office, sit in our car again, and then go home and 
um, you know, it's just not conducive to our, our environment's not conducive to getting out there and, and exercising. So what are the solutions that Lead ND is proposing? How is Lead ND measuring these things? So first of all, they define a neighborhood development as uh, anything that's going to be, uh, it can be any development that's uh, roughly three acres to 300 acres, but it can, it's been, they've, they've, they've used building, single buildings for a neighborhood development. It's just a you know, mixed use type of structure. But it can be all commercial, it can be all res residential, or it can be a mixed use. The credit categories, as we've mentioned before, are smart location and linkage, neighborhood pattern and design, and green construction technology. And that, again, breaks back into the uh, National Resource Defense Council, the Congress from the Urbanism, and the USGDC. So what's the most important thing when it comes to smart location and linkage? It's location, location, location. And so basically, they want to minimize the impact of new development and avoid sprawl. In order to do that, there's a prerequisite for smart location. We talked about that a little bit before, but basically don't build on a greenfield site. You are allowed to build on a greenfield site if you are building next to a transit corridor because that's already been slated for um, development basically by the, the regional uh, governing body. You cannot build on uh, imperiled species or ecological communities. Um, so you need to preserve uh, any habitat that's critical habitat for uh, species, and you can get that information typically from um, any state wildlife agency. You don't want to build to destroy or disturb natural hydrology, uh, habitat, or biological diversity. So you really don't want to impact wetlands and water bodies. And what's interesting is that uh, in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment developed by the United Nations, 50% um, of or our, our wetlands and water bodies have degraded in, the nor in North America by about 50% since 1950. And there's a lot of services that these, these, these wetlands and water bodies provide, including um, stormwater management, storm surge protection, um, uh, water cleansing, uh, things like that. So there's a, a not, not to mention recreation and uh, spiritual well-being. Agricultural land conservation. Basically, you can't build on prime farmland because our, our farmland, like I said, has been um, degrading at alarming rates across the country. And especially is that uh, in Texas, we've lost huge amounts of agricultural farmland uh, here in the last 10 to 20 years. They don't want you to build on floodplains. Uh, floodplains actually are very valuable when it comes to high, uh, regional hydrology so that it, and also habitat. Um, it, it provides that protection from flash flooding and uh, storm surges. So that, that area is off limits for lead for neighborhood development. Getting into credits, you can get credits for building in preferred locations. So if you have a location with high connectivity to, to other uses and areas, if you have a high priority location that's been designated by the local jurisdiction that um, is going to be, is, has been targeted for redevelopment, it could be a brownfield site or it could be a mixed income development or a mixed use uh, area that's, that's looking for redevelopment in um, infill sites. You can get credit for building on an infill site if you have a place that's got existing infrastructure that's, that's surrounded by existing development. And you can get up to 10 points for that. So when you're looking at a point-based system, you can get uh, quite, a lot of, quite a lot of points just for this one, one item. And that's designed on purpose so that the system encourages developers to build an infill site rather than um, sprawl locations. Brownfield redevelopment is another area that, that is promoted in the lead in these system. So it, you get up to two points if you build on uh, an existing dedicated brownfield site and, and clean the site and then build on it. Uh, if it's a high priority brownfield site, you get an additional point. So let's say that would be an EPA designated Superfund site or something of that effect. Or anything that perhaps uh, impacts uh, 
specific community, uh, like an underserved community. Another way that lead and measures measures. Melissa, the this is Barbara. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Is there some way um, with these standards that you're going through right now to kind of relate it back to maybe the planning challenges that you experienced at Alliance Town Center somehow, or how you achieved some of the points? Just a couple examples. Well, we didn't achieve all of these points, and the the, the difference is, I, I I will. I'll start doing that. Um, the okay. rating system has changed from the pilot. So some of these points are a little bit different, and it's, I, I don't typically relate it back directly to what we did at Alliance oftentimes because some of the requirements have changed. Um, but I can, I can do that as much as I possibly can. I just yeah, or any of your other projects. You yeah. Say that again? Or any of your other projects. Just go on ahead. OK, great. So. Um, Reduced automobile dependence is, is one aspect of the late the lead ND system that if you reduce vehicle miles traveled, then uh, you can get up to seven points. So one of the things we did at Alliance Town Center is we had a lot of housing located to a job center. So we had a we had a uh, mixed use area surrounded by some high highly dense housing. Um, and uh, we're also located along a transit corridor and so we could with the nearby housing, um, we could reduce vehicle miles traveled. Based, we did that based uh, uh, TMZ, the transit. Oh, I forgot what TMZ stands for. Off the top of my head, of course. Um, transportation management zone. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, another way you can get credit and help lead and be measures reduced vehicle impact would be a bicycle network and storage. So this is different than your typical lead. I'm going to put a bi some bicycle racks in the shower or under development bicycle network that's a minimum of three miles. Uh, so we actually had a, a local bicycle network in, for the Alliance Town Center that we were able to connect to. We organized and designed bike lanes and uh, had storage as uh, prescribed in the lead in these systems. So what this does is it supports public health and it provides a way for people to get out and get moving in their day-to-day -day lives without having to get in their car, drive to work, drive home, and then go to the gym and lose time, lose additional time perhaps with their family. Housing and jobs proximity is another uh, element where if you have a major employment center uh, in a diversity, uh, diverse mix of uses, you can get credit in the lead ND system this way. It also promotes affordability, so it links back to some other affordability credits in the system. Um, this one, we didn't have enough jobs, a, a large enough job center, like an office park, to achieve this credit. Steep slope, slope protection is another one that addresses uh, natural hydrology and stormwater management. It also uh, protects habitat. So um, this is if you have any any slope or grade above 15 degrees or 15 um, yeah 15 to 15 to 45 degrees especially is what it, it measures. But make sure that you don't develop on those areas so that the, the erosion control can hap happen in a natural way. We didn't have a lot of slope. Our site was very flat, so it was uh, not a credit that we could achieve. Or I think we got credit for it because we didn't build on any um, steep slope. You can also design for habitat or wetland and water body conservation. So in addition to not impacting existing communities, you can uh, reconstruct habitat and wetland and get credit for that. Uh, you can also restore any impacted habitat or wetland. That you can get points for that as well. And in addition to that, you can dedicate that land for a long-term conservation, so anything above 10 years, then you have to. The interesting about, thing about that is, well, this is preserve in perpetuity. That, that actually has changed to um, has to be a minimum of 10 years, and that 10 years has to be funded. So it's not that you can you just say, oh, we're going to you know, conserve this, this natural habitat. You have to actually be able to fund the, the conservation of that. So natural land may 
take care of itself in the wilderness, but whenever it's amidst development, you have trash and things like that that impact it um, that you have to you have to clean up and take care of. We did not achieve, we did not go for that one, I don't think. It, it's been a, a year or two since we certified that, so I, I don't remember specifically every single credit. But, uh, I'll do my best. Um, so for the way that the rating system looks at the organization of the development is really going to be looking at how that the traditional neighborhood development set up. So basically the, the Congress for New Urbanism smart code is or smart growth code is really what we're what we're looking at here. So in Texas a lot of people are afraid of density. Um, they don't they they think of this as density, you know, downtown in uh, areas that are that have tall skyscrapers that are packed full of people. But we're not necessarily talking about that. We're talking about uh, this is we're, this is not this is the New York type of density. We also have just another connotation of density here in Dallas and the North Texas region is you have um, apartment dwellings. So people think, oh no, I don't want apartments in my backyard. We don't want um, we don't want to have this impact on our community. You know, and then you have uh, even further you have a more uh, dated apartment community, and so maybe it's got uh, not necessarily the, the type of people you want in your community um, because it, the perception is that uh, low-income uh, families live in apartment complexes and we don't want low-income families near us. We, we have to have be segregated and such. And so what we're really looking at is a traditional neighborhood development. And so we're looking at you know walkable areas. This is actually in Maine. This is another type of site that, that would be uh, well measured and lead for neighborhood developments. And this has got street parking, street trees, uh, got, a, got density with uh, retail below, office above. This is actually Lawrence, Kansas. And then near and dear and close to home, we have Granbury, Texas. Again, this is for just tr traditional hometown uh, city center where you have civic spaces, you have retail spaces, there's um, office. So it's just a mix of things with density, and but not high density, but this is just your, your hometown kind of an entity. And my hometown that I'm from is, uh, is something like this as well. So what the Congress of New Urbanism, Urbanism is looking at is how do you organize development so that you have balance? And so what they've done is they've looked at this natural transect. So you have a more dense area, the back dune. Uh, so this would be a, a beach, basically, natural transect. And then you have a secondary dune, which is a little less dense. And then it, the density tapers down until you have a natural area. Or in this one, it would actually be another natural transect. Um, and so the way. Uh, the development is broken down as you're looking at uh, basically any kind of hospital or entertainment district, so a special district. You have an urban core, where, which is highly dense, something like that first New York City area slide. Uh, you have something that's an intermediate density that would be uh, you know, that more Granbury hometown density, so it would be an urban center. And then you taper out to a mix of maybe more housing and uh, with uh, retail and non-commercial uh, flipped in. And then you have a more suburban type of location that may be organized a little bit differently, rural and then natural land. And then you can see how this correlates to those natural transects. Um, here it is a little bit uh, bigger, where you can see the density. And I'm sure with the APA, you guys are all pretty much familiar with that, so I don't want to well on that too long, but here you have a comparison of a typical um, suburban development and a new urbanist development. And so what you have is there's the same number of residences and businesses on the left side is as on the right side. However, the right side, the right side is organized much more efficiently than the left even though the, the residences are the same square footage and the same number. 
But here you, you could have a grandmother and grandfather living in this house right here and their grandkids living here in this house. And in order to, to get to their grandkids, because they have to cross the creek, they ha would have to get in their car, drive to the main road, again, to another arterial road, back down, and then enter their uh, neighboring development and then visit their grandchildren. But here, you could say, let you could have your grandparents living here and your grandkids living here, which is actually further away physically than these two, but they could get walk or they could ride a bike or take a wheelchair and go from one to the other very easily and vice versa. What's happening here also is you're preserving a lot more land. So you have a lot more uh, stormwater management. You have a lot more native space. You could have uh, urban agriculture, any kind of any other uses of that land, but it's just so much more efficient than what we what we how we develop typically. They want pedestrian oriented development. This is actually a walking school bus, which I thought was a lot of fun. Um, again, a way to get out and get moving on your day to day basis without uh, get, to get that exercise without having to go to a gym or do something special. Uh, we're looking at multimodal transportation, different ways to calm traffic rather than just having a five-lane road and a speed limit sign that says 30 miles an hour. Um, so these are typical um, traffic calming methods. Uh, we want street trees are going to be another benefit. What's interesting about street trees is that there's actually a When you walk down a street that has street trees, that has higher density here and street trees, if you think about when you walk into a parking lot um, or walk, walking into a big box store, you park your car and you walk through a big, blank, empty uh, or, or uh, open parking lot that may have a lot of cars, but it's not necessarily that, that safe feeling that you might have if you're walking down a street with uh, a building and a tree and you don't feel like somebody's going to run you over. Uh, it's going to measure access to jobs and services, so make sure that people are living and working in uh, nearby areas. Also, civic spaces, you want to be able to accommodate civic spaces. You want to have services nearby, so uh, restaurants, grocery stores, hardware stores. You want to have a diverse use of, 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 of um, spaces in the development so that you can do a lot of things nearby without having to to get in your car and drive or without having to drive long distances. So something else we're looking at is what kind of housing we have. It's not all single family housing. It's not all commercial or, or um, apartment housing. You want, it measures the different uh, diversity of housing stock. So you want to have housing that, that is good for all uh, ages, for all um, income. So one of the things you're looking at is allow for single family homes. You might want to have an, a, a type that would be a, a larger single family home and then maybe a smaller home with a less yard for somebody who may be retiring or or someplace for people to move uh, young couples without kids or who, who don't want to have a yard. Um, any baby kids coming out of high school going into college. Uh, a diversity of, of people, a diversity of housing and giving people choices so that if a, if a family, let's say, a family with two kids, the kids move away, the parents uh, want to retire and move into a different type of, of space, or the kids want to move out and move into an apartment, they don't have to move to the next town. They can live, they can still live near their parents, or, you know, if you have retired grandparents, you can, you can take care of them within the same community instead of having to go to completely different communities. You want pedestrian-oriented houses. Um, a lot of times you can have uh, front porches that gives you a connection to your community. Um, so you can have that your own space that's private, but you can still get to know your neighbors. You know, there's nothing that's welcoming about this image that's on the lower right-hand corner. It's, it's cold, it's detached, but here it's warm. You also have shading elements. 
So um, when you have a, a front porch, you can have uh, your windows shaded so you reduce solar heat gain in uh, climate where that's beneficial. You want to promote open space. So again, E.O. Wilson is a biologist who has studied the connection between uh, the human psyche and connection to happiness, but there's a connection to uh, open spaces and nature. You can have uh, urban gardens that teach people to grow their own food, that grows food locally, teaches children where their food comes from. Also, uh, getting credit for redeveloping suburban locations. You can do a lot of a lot of inspirational things, a lot of a lot of beneficial uh, things with existing infrastructure, so that you don't have to build out. You can build up or around where you where you live. Design guidelines are something that that the lead and these system references. So this would be your your form-based code. It definitely looks at the, the transect of the street, so you have that section of the street and how it impacts with street trees, parking, pedestrians, uh, looks to building height to width ratio, or building street to building height, street width to height ratio. Um, so it credits uh, diverse use of space, mixed use development centers. So how does the system measure these things? Because it definitely finds them important. So um, I'm going to have to rush through this, this bit real quick. I think we're getting short on time. So neighborhood pattern and development, compact walkable environments. You want vibrant neighborhoods. With, with, with uh, Alliance Town Center, we had a, a kind of a mixed use center of the community that had lots of, uh, it had a hotel, it had um, residential, it had retail, it had uh, some residential um, office space. So it was very diverse, very um, rich in mixed use. And then surrounding that was a diverse type of housing. And, so, and it was all connected with uh, bike lanes and sidewalks and street trees. So. You have a prerequisite for walkable streets, which is basically to promote walking, um, to make sure that you have an open community that's not gated um, to support public health and things like that. Compact development, we already talked about that prerequisite, where you have to have a typical a, a, a average density that's above a certain level. Community, so you have to have a high level of connectivity. And what this is looking at is not necessarily uh, the, the type of spaces you have, but you want to connect to the outside community. So, in like your typical, where I, where I showed that other image with the the grandparents who had to drive to their kids grandkids' house, which is across the creek, you want to be able to have connections to different communities. And so, it is open, and that other people, the people who are surrounding, feel that they're a part of. You also get credit for walkable streets. And this is actually the credit that you get the most points for. You get 12 points for walkable streets. And so this, it's really uh, encouraging developers and project teams to look at the fabric of the, of the system and not just look at where it's located or what materials are. Want to support public health and, and a that sense of community. Um, you get additional points up to six points for compact development. With this one, we really struggled. Um, at first with this in, at Alliance Town Center, because it, it is a, a somewhat extra location, it's, but it is along a transit corridor, and it, it's adjacent to um, the Alliance Airport, which is uh, north of Fort Worth, Texas. And so we really did struggle trying to get that, uh, especially the, the non-residential density, because it, there is a level of more cost whenever you have to build parking garages and, and um, build up rather than out. And so we struggled with the balance of the density versus the attraction of new retailers and new um, commercial tenants. Uh, we also had a lot of density when it came to housing. And so I think we had like 24 dwelling units per acre for housing. So but we had a, we had a wide 
range of types of housing that were there to choose from, but it was mostly townhomes. Um, mixed use neighborhood centers. Uh, we did have a mixed use neighborhood center that um, clusters that those land uses in, in one area and uh, encourages people to to come to walk from their homes or ride their bikes from their homes uh, to to do different errands. Um, Mixed income diverse communities. We actually did have an element of this at uh, Alliance Town Center. It was a little bit different credit back then. Um, it was split into rental and for sale housing. And we did ours, I think, uh, mostly in the rental area. But this, this basically measures your affordability against the average median income. And you have a certain percentage of, of housing that is uh, designed for and um, sold at specific rates at either 85% of AMI or even 100 to 120% of uh, average median income. You get credit for reducing uh, your parking footprint. So if you get credit for building parking decks, uh, for building uh, surface lots that are less than two acres. Again, encouraging physical activity so that um, you don't have a large, vast parking lot that is, again, uncomfortable to walk across. You can get credit for having a, a, a dense street grid net network. So this is basically counting intersections. And so these intersections here would not, this intersection would count, but these intersections here would not um, because there's no outlet to any other location. Uh, you get credit for having transit facilities that are covered and lit. So you have a, a dry place to wait for the bus or the train, um, a place to have bicycle storage. We did not have public transportation. They were working on it with the city of Fort Worth to get bus routes to, to Alliance, but it hadn't been finalized. And I, I, I still think it's up in the air on that one. The interesting thing about Leeds, about, about Alliance Town Center is that we were doing the, map, the, ma the bulk of the design and development planning in 2006 and 2007 and then into 2008. So when 2008, so when the economy crashed in 2008, it really just put the brakes on our development the way. went through with the certification the way we had it designed. Um, but the reason, one of the reasons we're not going for that stage three certification is because the, the development is changing a lot. It has picked back up a little bit uh, in the last year or so, but it's not going to be exactly what we had uh, designed previously. You can get up to two points for transportation demand management. Um, again, reducing your uh, vehicle miles traveled based on your TMZ. You can have credit for access to civic and public spaces. A lot of times civic spaces are excluded from um, the rating system from, from commercial development. So you get credit for including those areas. You also get credit for parks and recreational facilities. We had some of those uh, at Alliance Town Center. You can get credit for um, visibility and universal design. So we did not get this one. Um, we didn't design our residences basically for uh, for accessibility. Um, we did have good visibility, however, when it came to security and uh, access to uh, parks and things like that. You get credit for community outreach and involvement. Um, this is one that's really interesting. We thought we were going to get this on Alliance Town Center, but we didn't have, we hadn't documented our meetings that we'd had well enough, so it, it didn't really um, come through for us. But basically, this is going back to the community and saying, what do you want? How, do, how can we uh, serve your needs so that you're not excluding or trying to uh, uh, relocate an existing community. You want to work in community within communities that are there and invite them into the process and hopefully improve the, the fabric of your of your development that way. Um, local food production, you get a credit for that one point. Uh, again, teaching kids how to grow, how to grow food and where their food comes from. Um, also. community-based agriculture. You get credit for street trees. We did get this one on uh, Alliance Town Center. 
You also get credit for putting in a school because, again, a lot of times schools are excluded from uh, the way developers will develop a community. So um, it encourages walking to school and, and having a walkable way to get to school and um, having a school within your community. So I'm going to, I know we're getting short on time. Uh, the, the last little bit is the infrastructure improvements, um, integrated infrastructure based on the traditional US GDC lead guidelines. So um, this is a lot of what has been developed and uh, presented a lot. So it probably won't be uh, really um, anything different than your typical lead system. Stormwater management is something that's an issue. It's measured very well with lead and D. This is a, a community where we don't have um, where we don't have curbs, so the runoff is going into the the park area and some swales. Um, so that basically stormwater management areas. Uh, you have surfaces that are um, pervious for walkability. Uh, heat island reduction, basically reducing the, the solar heat gain on your buildings. You can use and, and on your site, so you can use pavers and high uh, albedo materials for these. Um, you can have it looks at distri distributed energy. It measures the loss of those of those lines, of uh, the, the, the transmission losses. Encouraging uh, district heating and cooling. So locating co-locating energy generation and using any waste heat to, to heat or cool a building. And so how does LEED measure some of these items? Um, you have to have, if you want to basically improve energy efficiency, improve water efficiency, look at waste management, um, and reduce the impact of construction and operations. So for the prerequisites, we have to have at least one building that is LEED certified. We have to have uh, an average efficiency of 10% over ASHRAE 90.1-2007, and you also have to have a minimum water efficiency over 20% of a baseline. And so those are typical of your green building systems. And then for construction activity, you have to have an erosion and sedimentation control plan that's, again, in line with, uh, with the typical lead systems, and those are your infrastructure prerequisites. Then you get credit for any additional certified buildings up to five points. And um, you also get credit for having 90% of your building stock in, with uh, high energy efficiency up to two points. Now, what's interesting about that is your typical lead system will have 19 points for energy efficiency, whereas this one is two, but you have 12 points for, um, for walkability and seven points for density. So you're looking at those different credit weightings, rate, weightings in the rating system. You get credit for reducing your water use over 40%. Again, just one point, um, as opposed to, I think, four or five in the typical system. You get credit for reducing your landscape irrigation needs by 50%. Um, you get credit for building reuse and adaptive reuse, and you get additional credit for historic preservation of buildings. Our, our development at Alliance Town Center was ground up all new, so we didn't have any of these opportunities on that one. We did get um, the water use reduction and the LEED certified buildings. I think we got three or four points for LEED certified buildings on that, that project. Uh, you can also get credit for minimizing site disturbance and basically preserving heritage and champion trees. So you don't want to go, you don't want to have a lot of staging beyond what you're going to build so you don't impact these natural spaces. But you also make sure that you have your quality um, tree canopy is going to be preserved. We had uh, basically a, a, an open site, so that wasn't relevant for ours. We did get credit for points for stormwater management. Um, so if you reduce by 40% over a baseline, um, you, can improve your, you can improve your rating at that point as well. You get credit for heat island reduction. We achieved this at Alliance Town Center. It's actually relatively easy. Solar orientation. So this is looking at if you're orienting your site on or your, your plats on an east-west axis versus a north-south axis. So you get credit for east-west. Um, and this is something that's not really measured in any other, other of the lead systems. Um, you get credit for distributed energy, so on-site renewable energy. You can do uh, biomass, 
hydro scale, uh, small scale hydro, um, photovoltaic wind, any of these. In, in Dallas, we actually have an opportunity for active geothermal. I know that most of that is uh, in Northern California, but we have some um, engineers with, who team up with the Southern Methodist University who are trying to look at opportunities for distributed geothermal energy here in the Metroplex, which I think is a really interesting proposition. Um, up to three points on that one. We, we talked to them about that for Alliance Town Center, but it just wasn't quite there yet. You get credit for district heating and cooling, um, and you get credit for infrastructure energy efficiency. So if you have energy efficient light fixtures and um, uh, stop, stop lights and things like that, then you get, you get point, a point for that. And we did achieve that with our lighting and uh, energy design at the Alliance Town Center. You get credit for wastewater management. So if you're cleaning your wastewater, wastewater to potable standards, um, then, or if you divert it by 50% your wastewater, you can you can uh, get credit there. We did not go for that one <laughs> on the Lions Town Center. You also get credit for specifying and including recycled content in your infrastructure uh, and reducing hazardous waste. So we were able to um, we were able to achieve that at the Lions Town Center as well. And you also get a point for light pollution reduction. So you preserve the night sky, um, and that helps with migrating birds. It helps with uh, spiritual and recreational because you can have that access. Um, so we, we were able to achieve that one at the Lions Town Center as well. We just made sure that we reduced our lighting power density. We looked at our photometrics and uh, made sure that we didn't have over, we weren't overlit in certain areas, and that we also looked at full cutoff light fixtures so we didn't have uh, light spilling into the night sky, which is more um, wasteful anyway. It's not as efficient to push the light into the sky whenever you really want to light what's on the ground. Um, also get up to five points for innovation and design, and you get uh, a point for elite accredited professional. And so we got, we got two of the, at that point, it was only four ID credits involved. Um, we got the point for the elite accredited professional. Regional priority, basically, we talked about that a little bit. Um, you you get credit for things that items that are uh, specific to your area. So here in Dallas, we have a lot of brown fields, so that might be a, a regional priority credit here. It's based on um, based on analysis that was done by committee, um, and that's it. So some resources that I've that I that you guys could look at. I'm sure that American Planning Association has uh, smart code down. Um, <laughs> and then you, we also have the North Central Texas Council of Government. A lot of uh, municipalities or uh, metropolitan regions have their own council of government. So you could go uh, go web search for the Reference Center for Disease Control, the Urban Land Institute, the Congress for Urbanism, uh, U.S. Green Building Council the National Renewable Energy Lab. And uh, a, a fun one for people to put their address again in is, so, is com, And so you can put your address and, and see how walkable your neighborhood is. It's on a one being the, the lowest and 100 being the highest. And um, it's a lot of fun. So my contact information is Melissa Wackerly at thatgroup.com. If, if I don't get to your question and you want to ask, some additional questions, then uh, you can feel free to email me. So, Abra, do we have any uh, questions? I know I'm. Yes, we have several questions. Um, if you could just start off, um, we we understand as planners that there's this rating system out there that you can earn points for specific developments. Um, but is there some sort of overarching document? Um, that's out there that can maybe help us with the regulatory side of things to encourage these standards or to maybe require them? Is there any sort of document out there like that? There actually is um, a document that's been developed by the USGBC that is a guideline to encouraging municipalities to um, make it more developer friendly. Uh, with codes and, and standards and zoning. So the USGBC does have a document that uh, that is a guide for cities to implement some of these, these 
initiatives. So if whoever asked that wants to send me an email, I can I'd happy I mean, I'd be happy to send a link to the the guidelines. Okay, is that on the US GBC website? It is on the US GBC website. It should be okay. under I think lead rating systems and then lead for neighborhood developments and there's probably an area that's resources or something of that effect. Okay. Um, also, um, let's see, we have a lot. Um, is it, can you go into kind of the background behind why um, lead and B certification for a building or for a development would be important to us as planners? The overarching kind of background why lead was created? Lead was really created as a measurement tool to, it, it's the, really the, the same reason the lead for new construction rating system was, was developed is kind of a, a benchmarking system for development so that cities or um, I know Enterprise has, Community Foundation has a, a way to measure the sustainability of areas, but it's just a measure of what was actually done is the third party certification to say you know, are we really green? How green are we really? So it's be, it would be really for uh, marketing um, to to show people that yes, our community was sincere and successful at developing a green rating, a, a green development. Um, looking at incentives, you can get incentives oftentimes. Uh, with grants and such, which we talked about early on. So there's a few different, different reasons to certify for in the, uh, some people just like to use them as guidelines. Uh, the difference between that is, you know, it's different to use it as a guideline than, with cert than certification because you don't necessarily have that, that check and balance of what was planned versus what was implemented. Okay. Um, we, we have several people interested in how to become a LEED APND certified planner. And I provided the link um, on the question panel, but can you kind of talk about that just for a minute, about how to get certified as a planner? There's basically a tiered system to becoming a LEED accredited professional. Uh, you have to first start with the green associate. So there's a, basically a testing format. So there's a, the tiered testing is the green associate, which is your basic lead skills and knowledge. And then you go into what's called a specialty exam. And so you would apply to take the green associate exam, and then you would apply to take the um, specialty exam. And so the specialty you would select then would be the neighborhood development specialty. You can take those tests at the same time. So you could take one and then the, the green associate and then right at the same time take the specialty or you can take the green associate and then have some time in between and, and take the specialty uh, and then have that lead in the accreditation. So at that point you would have a certain amount of continu continuing education requirements that you have to keep up as well. Some of them would be lead specific and some of them could be just uh, subject related. Okay. Um, we have a gentleman on here who has passed the Green Associate exam, but is looking for kind of an experience to experience a lead APND project, um, or however you say it. And is there yeah, some way... He's looking for project experience? Yes. Is there some way you can find that on the internet somewhere, or do you just have to dig? You know, one thing about LEAD ND is it hasn't been adopted as commonly as LEAD for new construction right now. I think mostly because the development market is still pretty depressed. Um, I would probably contact my local U.S. Green Building Council chapter and see if they have any registered LEAD ND projects. Or you could reach out to the LEAD ND um, team with U.S. GBC to see if they know of any opportunities that might exist for a, a learning process to maybe practice with documenting uh, credits or uh, integrating with the lead online system or something to that effect. But probably uh, your local USGBC or 
there is a, a lead in the, I think, contact email address on the USGBC website. They have a they have a development team with USGBC that's actually very responsive. Okay, and how is Lead ND different from Lead AP? There, it's just confusing. It is confusing. <laughs> so, uh, a Lead AP is a Lead Accredited Professional, and that's okay. kind of a a defunct term where that what we call legacy lead AP um, is just kind of a catch-all phrase. Uh, lead AP is a catch-all phrase between GA, uh, specialty, um, and what we call legacy, who are people who tested prior to 2009 um, when the system changed to be uh, to follow uh, the ISO standards. So um, basically, a lead AP is anybody who has that lead accreditation. Now what you have is a lead green associate or a lead with specialties. So I, I am a lead with two special, uh, lead AP with two specialties. So I have a specialty in building design and construction and I have a specialty in neighborhood development. So that's two different uh, accreditations that I have to maintain continuing education for. So what you would say is on my business card it says lead AP BD plus C or BDMC, and then it says lead AP, or then it says ND as well. So you would say, you would say lead BD, BDMC or lead ND. So and there's guidelines on the US GBC's uh, website or the GBCI's website that will give you the the best way to document that on your business card or other marketing Add materials. Add that to AICP and you get the whole alphabet. Um, oh yeah, I got alphabet soup, and it's, I don't even put most of my stuff on my card. <laughs> okay, we have a question. There was a slide where you're talking about BMI and age, um, and it yes. says that it looks based on the chart that the population ages, or as the population ages, it gains weight, and that there is a shift to the south and southwest. And the question is, doesn't doesn't that relate to the movement and aging of the population, or can you kind of? Um, I don't know how that that CDC study and analyzed the popu the aging population. Um, let me see if I can find that I slide think real quick. It. Um, it, uh, I know. There. And it's been a while since I've read that study, so I don't remember exactly how it was looking at the aging population, or if it was just looking at um, that other demographic of the, the obesity. But if you, but there's also a matter of, um, for a long time, uh, before 1990, let's say, we also had elderly people um, that they weren't living as long, but I would imagine that um, you would have a benefit of exercise to improve longevity as well. So okay. I, unfortunately, I, I can't speak in extreme detail to the CDC study. I know it's been updated, um, I think, in the last year or two. OK. Um, there's an, kind of an easy one. What you, I know it was a pilot project, but did you what lead certification level was given to the project that you worked on in um, Alliance Town Center. Uh, a couple of points away. Or excuse me, but we were only able to achieve certified. Okay. Which was, you know, I, I say only, but it was a monumental effort. I'm saying it was not an easy task. Um, there's kind of a, a few questions about. Um, Maybe maybe the process of submission is it a one set process two set process that sort of thing. It depends on if you're going if you're going to go for stage one stage two and stage three then you're going to submit for review three times. But let's say you're just going for one stage is. Um, prepare your documentation, submit it to the GBCI and USGBC, um, and then they, the, it was actually the GBCI who reviews it 
um, they would review it then provide comments on additional information they are looking for or uh, any revisions they think need to be made you would then re respond to the clarifications submit those clarifications to the review body and um, then you would achieve, you would receive your final certification so they would show whichever credits were approved or denied um, if any were denied and then so you would get your final certification okay um, if a local government um, requires a particular standard that also coincides with um, getting points does that negate the point, or do you still, um, they've got an example of water recharge requirements, dark sky ordinances, that sort of thing. Do you still get the points even if it's required by a local government? Yes. Okay. So if you, um, if you build in a city that requires those things, then they're going to encourage that for sure. Okay. And um, also, the presentation will be online. Um, so. You can look for it. Um, ben, I think it's on the Ohio APA website. Is that correct, or is it the Utah? Oh, it's the Utah APA. Uh, I'll send it to everyone on chat. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a lot of questions in here. How about this one? Uh, per the minimum density requirement of at least seven dwelling units per acre, is this minimum requirement calculated using gross density or net density? Um, I guess just a density question. Are you familiar with how to calculate density for the requirements? I know how to calculate density for the requirements. I think I just don't know. Off the top You're of your talking head. about dwelling units per acre about net versus gross. Because what we did was we really just looked at how many how many we had, not necessarily how many were occupied. If that's if that's going to be mm -hmm. the difference that's made between net and gross. So it's how okay. many are provided, not how many are actually occupied. OK. Um, and I guess there are a couple of folks asking about different types of credits besides CM credits for AICP. Um, they're asking about AIA credits and LEED credits. Um, is there any way to apply for those? I'm not familiar um, it, it this this presentation is approved for USGBC and AIA. I don't know quite how that works through the American Planning Association, the APA. So that would be more of a question for Ben. Okay, we'll let Ben think about. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't it's okay. have answers to that one. I apologize. Um. Got that on. We're just going to go through a couple more. Sure. What, um, uh, this is a constant struggle with planners and engineering departments and whatnot, but um, the question is what maintenance plans are out there for trees as part of the streetscape in place in the sidewalk? What is the cost of maintenance? Eventually the trees will grow out of their location. Has this been addressed? That hasn't really been addressed by the Lead for Neighborhood Development System. Yes, it's kind of the holy. Um, they do have the the requirement is a, a street trees every forty feet. So um, I guess maybe the spacing has taken that into into report into um, consideration. Mm -hmm. But as far as how to fund maintenance of those trees and how to evaluate the impact of their growth patterns, I, I don't know that that's been addressed by lead and D. Okay. I, or I don't, I'm pretty sure it hasn't been addressed by lead and D, let me say that. Okay. Um, you know, there there's kind of some broad concepts um, that you presented, and obviously we only have a short amount of time, but is what is the what does LEED do specifically to address issues of place, identity, and that sort of thing? Well, it measures those kinds of things, first of all, in um, crediting, preserving existing structures and historical, historical buildings. 
and it also uh, measures uh, com community involvement. So if if you have an existing community that you want to preserve, then you can have uh, meetings and um, review analysis. Um, different, there's, there's all kinds of different things you can do to involve the community. And so I think that those are probably the two most prominent ways that it addresses the sense of place as far as the, the community that exists there already. Okay. Otherwise, it credits you for building on existing infrastructure and in and, and sites. So um, it, that's kind of maybe not as related as those other two. OK. Um, let's see. There's some real specific questions about different standards. Um, but how do you demonstrate water use reduction on a project um, basis before buildings have been designed and built? Are you familiar with how? Yeah, you're basically looking at um, specifying um, standards. So you're going to coordinate standards of, of flush and flow rates with the, the design teams. So it might it's probably going to be more like a, a guideline. I know that at Alliance Town Center we did have a, a guideline requirements for what buildings would what what buildings would be like. So you would have uh, guidelines for your site. You'd have guidelines for your building. You'd have, um, you know, basically we had we had a lot for those things. Okay. Um, how does lead and D relate to existing neighborhoods? Can you go back retroactively and? You cannot. Yeah, there's that's been addressed. Um, um, that. He, if you have an existing neighborhood and you just want to measure that existing neighborhood, then it, it doesn't relate. It doesn't. It, they won't. They won't take that into account. But if you have and draw your boundary so that it includes the neighborhood. So if you have, let's say, um, a, a new development within that neighborhood, you can expand it to include it. Okay. Um, and maybe last one, because we could just go on forever. Um, <laughs> do you give credit to buildings capturing or using natural wind breezes by using wind catchers or ventilation systems? This one, this system does not, because it is a developed, it's a development-based system. I know that those things do relate um, in how you organize your development to uh, accommodate prevailing winds. But probably what you could do with that one is include that in an innovation and design point so that you could say that you, you've organized your development to, the, to such um, a manner that it pulls prevailing winds through and enhances the, uh, the natural ventilation of your buildings. I think that that would be a very strong innovation credit. OK. Um. I guess that's it, guys. Thank you for attending. Ben, do we need to do anything else? Um, that's it. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thanks, guys. I appreciate right. your time and, and your interest. All right. Thank you. For those of you who are still in attendance, um, I, I want to thank everyone. And uh, I just want to go through a few reminders. First off, to log your same credits for attending today's webcast. Please go to planning.org slash cm, select today's date, and then select today's webcast. This webcast is available for 1.5 cm credit and also recording today's session. So you'll be able to find the recording on youtube.com slash planning webcast and also utahapa.org slash webcast archive. All right, thank you.